Hi, welcome to the MPI workshop presented by the NSS Exceed program. This was originally a two-day event with hands-on exercises that you can view at your own pace. To get access to the exercises and slide content, look at the link below. This gives me the opportunity then to jump into the overview. It's kind of the only collection of buzzwords without programming that we'll do over the next couple of days, but to some extent, uh, understanding you know, buzzwords and jargon is a necessary evil here, so I'll cover it all here and we'll give you a good orientation as to where MPI fits into all these other uh, parallel computing options that you may or may not be aware of. You certainly will be by the time we're done here. And that way, when we talk about things in practical terms as we jump into the actual programming and hands-on, uh, I'll be able to, to refer back to these things and, and make some sense. So, uh, you know, as I said, this is the 50,000-foot view. We'll also have a... Uh, an outro talk at the end, which is a shorter version of this, where we'll be able to compare and contrast various programming, parallel programming approaches in a little bit more detail because at that point you will know how to do MPI. You'll be real MPI programmers. And so that's where we'll really dive into the software comparisons. This will be a little bit more hardware oriented. That one will be a little bit more software oriented. So the first theme here is, uh, is, is why do we need MPI? Why do we need large-scale computing, exascale computing, something I'll define here? Uh, what's the point of all of this? Many of you are coming in here with particular applications in mind. Uh, you know why you need MPI. Uh, some of you may not, but it's helpful for all of you to understand the demand, the applications that drive the development of this stuff, because that's how you're. That's why this stuff exists. It's how you're able to utilize things. And it gives you some idea what the roadmap of the future will be. Is your investment in MPI a good thing? Is this trendy? Is it liable to be uh, something that will be displaced by something else in a year or two? And you know, computing certainly uh, faddish things are, are not unknown. Matter of fact, they're, they're the norm, really, right? So. Uh, Let's, let's look at the applications that drive this stuff at the highest end, and this ultimately filters down to us. At the big end, if you, if you look at the largest machines in the world, and we will, we'll look at some, them in some, some depth. Uh, if you look at the largest machines in the world, the problems that they run are ones that are considered to be of great strategic importance to justify building $200 million or, or more these days computers, supercomputers. Uh, and they're, they exist because they have a lot of flops. So flops is a term that we'll use number of times over the next couple of days, and certainly you'll come across, if you stick around numerical computing at all, stands for floating point operations per second. And it's a nice way to characterize uh, the horsepower of a, of a computing platform. How powerful is it? How many flops, how many floating point operations per second can it do? It's also an important way to characterize the demands of your code. If you've got a numerical application, uh, the question someone you might ask of you is, you know, how many flops does it take to run your application? Uh, so these are 64-bit flops, by the way, I should point out. We're kind of standardized on scientific computing. By default, if somebody says a floating point operation, it's a 64-bit floating point operation. That's not always necessary. As a matter of fact, I often come across people that are using 64-bit precision uh, needlessly. Um, but at any rate, uh, it's, it's the default for flops when you talk about how many flops a machine does. It's, uh, it's funny that a lot of codes can benefit greatly from memory bandwidth issues and other things by going to 32 bits if they don't need it. And in the machine learning world today, we're finding that 16-bit or less precision is actually desirable for many things. But nevertheless, 64 bits in scientific computing is often required, and so it's the default. So how many flops do you need to run uh, a large climate model? Well, turns out you need a, a lot. We'll look at that definition a lot. It's a good example. I like a climate model. It's one we'll come back to in various forms over the next couple of days because it's a intuitive problem to understand. We're trying to do weather modeling in essence. In climate modeling, you're trying to do weather modeling except over the entire globe, and you're trying to do it over uh, decades, not the next day or 48-hour forecast. Uh, so it's not hard to imagine it takes extreme amount of computing power to do. Also, very large amounts of memory, something else that with MPI you'll have access to. You'll find that uh, for any of you that, uh, that have memory-bound problems or will find that you have memory-bound problems, you know, you don't have enough memory, MPI is a way to, to get past that, uh, lump a lot of memory together. So these very large problems like climate modeling demand it. I've got a slide here that gives you a pretty good idea with these large climate modeling problems how important it is, and you can see that the grid size really, as we go from a large grid in you know, the, early, the, the mid early 2000s, a grid size for a large climate problem would be something like a 200 kilometer grid or pixel of weather, if you will, or voxel. It's really a 3D problem. And 200 kilometers uh, might seem like that's reasonable you know, on a map like you know, the globe, but if you look out your window, 200 kilometers of weather certainly has a lot going on, and it's not, not particularly fine detail. Uh, and indeed, as you go to up three orders of magnitude in computing power, so that you can go to a 25-kilometer grid point, all of a sudden a lot more science emerges here. 
Uh, fluid dynamics is like that. And so we, we have a lot of stuff going on here that wasn't going on previously, but still 25 kilometers. Again, if you look out your window, 25 kilometers, there's a lot going on in there. You're ca not capturing you know, all of the, the physics that's going on. And uh, consequently, we need to go up another you know, three orders of magnitude to get down to even just a couple kilometers. So this is a good example of how insatiable uh, computing demand is for an application I think we all appreciate the, uh, the importance of. But sometimes we don't understand uh, the, uh, the requirements on the smaller scale problems can also be just as great uh, in the case of, say, uh, another fluid flow problem. That's why I picked this one, because it's also fluid flows, combustion. Now we're not talking about the earth. We're talking about something that might be an engine piston size problem or uh, perhaps for a lot of supercomputing world, there's a lot of them are, are things like turbines, steam turbines, things that fit in a room, a large room, but a room nonetheless. And if you're trying to model combustion and, and, and flow in these problems with the multi-physics that's going on, it also requires incredibly large amounts of computing power to the point where it requires the largest computing, these $200 million computing platforms. So, this is not just a few, a few large problems of you know, modeling the cosmos or modeling uh, the, the globe. Uh, supercomputers are required to model things at, at microscopic scale accurately as well. I'll give one last one here uh, that shows something in a kind of a very different direction, but also uh, equally important in these very large platforms, which is uh, modeling uh, brains, essentially. Uh, this is a, the, the, there are several brain initiatives, if you will, uh, currently in the United States and in Europe. Uh, and in China, they're being funded uh, to large scale. And uh, this group here, the Motor Group at IBM, is maybe the most well known. They've certainly been persistent. They've been at it for a while, so long enough that you can see the evolution of what they're doing here very well. As they went from a mouse brain with uh, 16 million neurons, 128 billion synapses, uh, to currently they're not quite at the human brain yet, uh, which is 22 billion neurons. Uh, but they've been gradually working their way there, steadily working their way there, this is a problem that requires the very largest machines to the point where this, this modeling right here, the human brain, is probably going to require an exascale computer. And so that's a term that I've mentioned, uh, and I should now define because you'll come across it, you'll trip over it all the time as you look at current discussions of computing. Uh, and that's because we've all been racing, converging uh, on a machine that is three orders of magnitude faster in terms of flops than the petascale type of machines or the petaflop capable machines that we're working on today. Today's large machines work in the petaflops range. So 10 to the 15 floating point operations per second, which is by many measures an incredibly impressive amount of computing power. It certainly takes a lot of hardware and a lot of uh, money, and a lot of power power, electrical power to do. Uh, but th that's the range we're in at the moment. We've been fixated because of Moore's law and other things that keep saying things are going to increase geometrically. We've been fixated on that next uh, generation of machines, the exascale machines, for about the past seven or eight years. We've been, been anticipating getting there. And at one point in time, it looked like we might get there by about 2020. Now we're thinking maybe a little bit past there. But everybody's racing towards it. What do I mean by everybody? Well, you know, any, uh, you know, any strategic the uh, thoughtful uh, organization or country or multinational organization these days recognizes how important supercomputing is. And so the United States and, and the EU and China and Japan are all, all have uh, exascale computing initiatives to build a machine that can do an exaflop of computing power. And that's 10 to the 18th floating point operations per second. And that's the level at which that human brain that I showed you starts to become viable. Uh, that's the level at which a lot of problems start to become more tractable in climate modeling and many, many other domains, which I didn't have the luxury of going into. I could spend hours talking about important problems that Exascale will enable. It will it'll allow the science to become really transformative and become much more applicable to real world problems. So everybody's racing towards this Exascale thing, and those developments filter down to the rest of us, whether you need to be there or not. Some of you, I'm sure more than a few of you out there today actually, will be using these exascale machines as, as quickly as you can get your hands on them. But for the rest of you, even if you think, well, departmental resources are kind of the level that I want to work at, everything filters down from that, that leading edge and the computing world fairly rapidly. We're not far behind. I'll give you some examples. of We're not far behind yesterday's supercomputers on the desktop today. So you're not getting to that level, though, without going very, very parallel. That's the main theme of this talk here, is that 
you, you can only use these machines or even your desktop machines today effectively if you're doing parallel programming. Serial programming is hopeless anymore in terms of getting any kind of reasonable performance out of any hardware platform, including your, your smartphone, for that matter. Here's a, a good illustration of that. Here's a, a fairly typical generic benchmark, uh, spec benchmarks, uh, a couple generations of them over time. And uh, this is, you know, there are lots of benchmarks apply to lots of different domains and everything, so we could pick different benchmarks. But pretty much any benchmark that you pick that's, you know, in the, the center of mass of generic numerical applications or video games or anything like that or web rendering uh, is going to show this kind of curve here where somewhere around the year 2004 or so in, in most any graph of this nature, somewhere around 2004, we lost what was decades of this kind of continual growth where every 18 months, every two years, computing power doubled. And this happened again for decades, since the early 60s. Somewhere around 2004 that quit happening. As a matter of fact, today we're already seven years or so behind where we would have been if that kept happening. It definitely stopped though. Things have really leveled out. Uh, this is quite visible in, in lots of different ways besides just a benchmark. It's invisible in terms of the clock rates of computers and, and lots of things. Now, this is uh, this right here is the, is the baseline proof that serial programming is dead in the sense of, well, if I just wait next year, the computers will be faster, more powerful, and run my code faster. So I'm going to write this, you know, this really slow code in whatever programming language is convenient, but it's okay. It'll just run faster next year. And that was true, actually, for, for many decades. You could count on things running twice as fast soon enough. That hasn't been true for a while. Now, this is not because something called Moore's Law that everybody likes to attach themselves to is dead. Moore's Law, to, to put it explicitly, Moore's Law is simply a, an observation that Gordon Moore made back in the mid-60s that uh, transistor densities, how many transistors you could cram into any given area of a chip, would double about every 18 months or so, two years, somewhere in, in that time frame. Uh, Moore's Law has, is not dead just yet, not quite. It's running into a wall pretty soon, but it's not dead yet. It certainly hasn't been dead over the past 10 years. Uh, you know, well, things have slowed down. Uh, it's not responsible for that cusp we just looked at. Moore's Law has is, is, is still been pretty healthy. The engineers have done a heroic job over four plus, five plus decades now of keeping it going through multiple revolutions in fabrication technologies and things like that. They've kept it going. So Moore's Law keeps giving us more and more transistors all the time. Uh, so we can't blame Moore's Law for being dead, although, again, it's, it's really starting to finally hit the limit. As a matter of fact, if you look into things pretty carefully, you can make an argument that Moore's Law did kind of die six or seven years ago, even, you can claim, uh, because transistors have, they, they still manage to keep tra tramming the transistors in there with things like 3D packaging and whatnot, but more and more of the transistors are lost to error correction and issues having to deal with, with uh, working at that scale. So uh, the cost tra for transistor has actually gone up for the first time ever. So at any rate, uh, Moore's Law may, may be defunct soon, but it's not responsible for that. What is responsible for it is something else we'll look at in the next slide. But first, I'll point out that this is another way to see that Moore's Law has continued. The engineers haven't disappointed us in giving us more transistors. Here's a pair of bunch of different common processors, popular processors. And you can see that over the past, well, however many decades you want to look back, uh, transistors that they cram in every couple of years under the chips do double. So today's processors do have a lot more transistors than processors from just a couple of years ago. So the transistors have, have been delivered by the engineers. So why have the speeds, why has serial computing come to such a halt? Uh, and, and this is the reason. This is probably in the next couple of days, for the two days of material that we're going to cover, this is probably the most important slide you could show somebody in terms of demonstrating the importance of parallel programming and MPI. Because this is the reason right here that parallel programming has taken over all of computing. And the reason that clock speeds, so here are those clock speeds over the past, uh, you know, however many decades here, three decades, and right around 2004, clock speeds have leveled off. Another crude measure of computing performance, whatever benchmark you want, clock speeds, you know, another one you could pick. Clock speeds leveled off around 2004. Why did they level off around 2004? Well, this is the reason right here, and this is the reason that parallel computing exists as such a dominant thing in, in computing today, and it's because the chips are running at the verge of melting, and that, that little bit of physics right there dominates modern computing design. Today's chips run at well over, well, in the order of uh, 100 watts per square centimeter is how hot they run. 
And that's, that's not a difficult number to actually understand, even if you're not a physicist. 100 watts of power, 100 watt light bulb is you know, something you wouldn't want to put your hand on, right? It would burn you immediately. It's a lot of power, and that's how much heat we're having to dissipate through a square centimeter, less than a postage stamp area of a modern computing chip when it's running full out. So that, that's an impressive amount of heat to dissipate, especially if you don't want to go into some exotic liquid cooling technology, you just want to blow a fan over things because that's convenient or it needs to sit in your lap on a laptop or be in your cell phone. So the fact that modern chips run at this, that temperature should impress you. We're well past how hot a hot plate is. This is much hotter than the surface of a hot plate. Uh, we're, we're coming up on nuclear reactors here. Um, so this right here is the physical limitation we ran into in 2004 is that as they cram more and more transistors into a small area, you know, uh, just running the current through them, switching them fast enough became the problem. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, if you are electrical, any electrical engineers out there, uh, we're running 100 watts through uh, at less than a volt through a uh, uh, one square centimeter area. That's, that's 100 amperes, basically, effective current we're running around in a square centimeter. So it's very impressive in multiple respects that these chips don't melt down as it is. So again, we could resort to, uh, to more exotic things, solutions like liquid cooling things. Here's a picture of a Cray-2 from uh, the mid-80s. Uh, this is not a new problem, by the way. In supercomputing, we've had to deal with this heat dissipation issues for a long time. So Cray-2 supercomputer in the mid-80s had this really uh, very artistic looking heat exchanger in front of it, full of uh, floor inert bubbling away when the thing was running to, to keep the thing from melting. So we could do that, but that's just not practical, right? You don't really want to worry about liquid cooling on your laptop. Uh, so instead, that's why we're in the parallel world we are in today. The engineer said, we've got more transistors. We can't keep running them at the same faster clock rates because we're cramming more in a small area that we've done in the past. So what can we do to get performance out of them? How can we still get a benefit even though we can't deal with the thermodynamics of this uh, without doing something that's uh, it's, uh, unfeasible? And so what they did was they recognized, they had this, this revelation, and it wasn't new to 2004, any particular year. Parallel computing has been around for a long, long time. But what they recognized was parallel computing had to make its way into the commodity world, the desktop world, your, your cell phone world. Uh, and so they, they recognized that if we've got all these transistors here, we could do what we've done for decades, which is make a bigger, faster, single core to run your serial code better. Use all the tricks that we can bring in with more transistors, add, add more cash, all these things that we can do that we've been doing. Instead of doing this, what if instead we broke this big core up into some smaller cores? So we use the same amount of power. So if we've got 100 watts running into this single big core, what if instead we made these four simpler cores? They're not going to be as clever. They're not going to have as much cash. They're not going to be uh, able to use as many tricks. But these four dumber cores will in net have more performance than our one big core. Uh, and if you actually want to look into the details, the performance scales roughly is the square root of the area. And there are a lot of different metrics and everything you can get into if you're interested in this. Uh, it's not inaccessible to understand some of the finer details here. But the bottom line is that instead of one big core, we'll have four or, or more smaller cores in parallel. Here's the kind of math that, that happened in the real world back when everything went from single core to double core around the turn of the century is that we said instead of having one core that's running at this voltage and this frequency, what if we take two cores and we run them at 15% less voltage, 15% lower clock rate, that equals, because of the way these things scale, it's the same amount of power, but now we've got 1.8 times the performance. So this is the math right here that makes parallel computing so compelling to the engineers. This is the reason it's not a fad, it's not a fashion, it's not something computer scientists who are interested in concurrent programming have foisted on the world. Uh, it's not something that we're going to change anytime soon. It's the fundamental physics of, of, of computing. Uh, here's a good example of how it's made its appearance on just the gen generic commodity chips. If we look at a processor from around the turn of the century, it could deliver around three flops floating point operations for every clock tick. If we look at a processor today, a Skylake processor, it's the kind that's in my laptop right here, it's not that exotic, it delivers close to 2,700 floating point operations for every click of the top, uh, of every tick of the clock. So this is an example of how incredibly parallel a generic modern processor is compared to a processor from just you know not even 20 years ago. This is where parallelism has crept in. If you can't take advantage of that, you can't use a modern processor well at all. So if you're writing some simple-minded program that's very inherently serial, you, you can see you're not going to get a percent of the performance capability of that processor. 
Uh, now, the way that it's actually made its way into a modern processor is a couple of different things are going on there. It's multiple cores, certainly. Modern processors like a Skylake's got 28 cores. So we've got a lot of cores going on. Each one of those cores also has a lot of uh, vector type instructions behind the scenes. Uh, these are instructions that work on a lot of thing, data simultaneously. You might hope that the compiler can do a lot of this magic for you here. So hope. Sometimes it's true with really simple loops. Sometimes it needs a little bit of help. But at any rate, you might, you might hope that this stuff stays hidden. But if you want to use multiple cores, well, you're definitely going to have to start to become a parallel programmer. But at any rate, you can see that parallel pr computing is not just some supercomputing kind of thing out there. It's, it's your laptop if you want to use it well. Or your smartphone. Again, modern smartphones, right? The latest Apple phones come out. They've got, what, six cores versus we compare them against Samsung's phones, right? You can see even people worried about smartphones. How good is my smartphone? worry about how many cores their phone has now. Everything is parallel. So we put all this stuff together that I've talked about in one place here, give you an idea here. The transistors again have kept coming. This is Moore's Law, so Moore's Law hasn't abandoned us. The single thread performance has really plateaued here. So being a serial programmer is a, is a dead end. Uh, you can see that in terms of the clock rate too. If you want something, it's a very simple metric. You can, you know, computers now today nowadays run at, you know, a couple gigahertz plus or minus a couple gigahertz. It's the same speed they were running 10 years ago. So clock rates haven't gone up. This processors serial performance is the same, because they can't. The things can't will, will melt if they keep cranking more power through them. So instead, what has happened is the number of cores in processors have climbed. And this is where your MPI programming is going to turn you into somebody that's instead of being dismayed by, this, by these facts, will be happy because you can take advantage of it. You can exploit this. So what does parallel computing look like? What, how do we actually do this stuff in parallel? And this takes us back to the fundamental uh, problem of parallel computing, how to break p things up into pieces so that they can be done in parallel. This is the, the ongoing discussion about how accessible parallel programming is, how likely you are to have success with your particular problem and application of parallel programming. And here's an example from way back from uh, the Mythical Man Month, which is a classic. Any of you that do uh, serious software development and software engineering uh, have probably or should certainly read this book. And Brooks Law from there basically said, if a woman can make a baby in nine months, well, then can nine women make a baby in one month? Well, that's absurd, right? But nine women can make nine babies in nine months. So this, is the, this kind of exposes the idea in parallel programming that things can be done in parallel sometimes. Sometimes it's not quite so obvious. Uh, sometimes it takes a little bit of different thinking. And this is the notion that we're going to, to get comfortable with over the next day as we, we apply MPI to different problems. So let's look at this from the perspective of a weather problem. Again, I like weather because it's intuitive. Everybody, no matter what background you're coming from, get kind of get the idea. If we wrote a weather model back in the 19... Uh, 70s, uh, we on a serial computer, we would basically do the same thing you'd do with many, many scientific problems. You'd break your weather map up into a grid. So we break our map of the United States here up into a grid. Each one of these mesh points on the grid is going to be, you know, have some, some wind velocities and some temperatures and some pressures and the various things that you want to use to compute your weather. Uh, and so what your CPU would do would be go over this whole grid and calculate, update the grid for the next time step in time based on the way the wind is blowing and, and, and the, you know, the, the atmosphere is flowing, so to speak. So this would be a classic serial way to write this code. Well, it so happens a guy named Richardson in 1917 figured out a way that we might do this uh, in parallel. And so in 1917, Richardson had this idea that if we had a bunch of uh, meteorologists in a room in his case, he envisioned like 60, 64,000 meteorologists would be in a room. Uh, and they would be able to break the weather map down into a bunch of small patches. And each one of those meteorologists would do the calculations in his day with a pencil and paper on the map. Uh, and you might wonder why he was worried about parallel programming in 1917. Well, he had this, this notion that they would do it with pencil and paper. And so uh, with pencil and paper on the map, they would do the calculations required to figure out the weather in their local neighborhood based on what's happening in, in the neighbor's neighborhoods. Right, because your weather only immediately depends on the neighbor, the, the weathering neighbor, the, the, the neighbor, the, the weather in proximity to you. So if we're sitting here in our corner of, uh, of Pennsylvania here, we only care about the weather that's flowing over the border from Ohio immediately. That's the weather that's coming in our face. The weather that's happening out in Indiana, it'll get here eventually, but for my immediate calculations, I only need to know about my immediate neighbors. 
So this is Richardson's idea. And again, he had 64,000 meteorologists scattered around with their own little patch of the map, and they would do this. And they would, after every calculation exchange with their immediate neighbors, the information they needed to advance the calculation in one step. And this was Richardson's idea of, of parallel, well, of, of how to compute the weather. Now we today realize this is very naive in that uh, pencil and paper isn't going to cut it because uh, you need a much finer grid and much more detailed modeling than you're ever going to do with hand calculations. But his idea and his paradigm is, is actually very sound and that indeed is how we do modern weather modeling. So here is how we would do modern weather modeling uh, on something like your laptop with multiple cores. So with multiple cores, if we had a laptop with four cores, for example, which many of you out there do have, uh, and we put the weather map on it, the way we might do this so that we get some speed up from those cores is we would break the weather map up into four pieces, and each one of those cores would be responsible for running kind of a serial approach uh, on its own section of the map. So we would do the old school serial code over its corner of the map, and the other three neighbors would do the same thing. And then at the end of each time step, they could exchange the information they need to exchange, which is just going to be along the borders, right? Which weather is flowing from here to here, and which weather is flowing from here to here. They would exchange that information along the border, and then they continue on with their own calculations. And the way we might do this, again, with four cores on a laptop, the simplest way, at least, would be to use a programming model of something called like OpenMP, which is for doing multi-threaded, multi-core programming. And it basically amounts to you take your old serial code and we would introduce some hints to the compiler, some things called directives to the compiler, and they would allow it to take and break up these, these simple loops uh, amongst these four cores. And that would be an approach that would work well with four cores on your laptop. Uh, and, and indeed, you might hope to speed things up about four times. might not be unreasonable. Probably speed things up like 3.8 times. Close to four times you might speed things up. This is like having four meteorologists in a room, and from Richardson's perspective, it's like having his, four of his meteorologists that he envisioned in a room, and they each work on one corner of the map. A different approach that you might take is using GPUs. For any of you that are paying attention, GPU programming has become incredibly important today in, uh, in modern programming because GPUs offer a lot of flops for uh, the money or for the power, actually. Those, so those are two good justifications. GPUs have a whole lot of flops. If you could look at how many flops you get out of a GPU, a card, an accelerator card, you could buy off Amazon, you buy this GPU and you slap it in your workstation. If you look at how many flops you get either per dollar, it's very competitive versus buying a better CPU. Uh, and if you're concerned about building a big room, you get a lot of flops per watt too. So if we're concerned about how much power it takes because we need to buy the power and we need to cool the room, uh, then those cards are incredibly efficient. So GPUs have become really important. And in some areas, they've taken over. So in machine learning, for example, it's pretty much all we focus on anymore. Uh, so GPU programming is a little bit different way of approaching this problem. GPU programming says, let's take our serial code version of this. And then we know this GPU over here has a lot of flops. But one thing about GPUs that we don't have time to get into, but I, I'm not misrepresenting here, uh, is that GPU cores are very simple-minded. They they're synchronized together. They all need to do the same operations in lockstep to a large degree. And so our weather map has to be put onto the GPU over, the, over some kind of bus. Usually when you plug your card in in your workstation, that's a PCI bus, is the, the, what it's called that you're plugging your card into. And that's actually fairly slow connection. You might think it's fast because it's right there on the motherboard, but it's a slow connection compared to normal memory speeds. So we, we have to cram the data over that PCI bus. We put it on the GPU. The GPU can only do a limited subset of operations on that weather map. We hope it can do as much as possible. With something like a weather problem, it might be able to do a whole lot of stuff. And then eventually it has to make its way back to the CPU, again, over this relatively slow PCI bus. So this is how GPU computing would approach this problem. This is like having one meteorologist who really knows what they're doing here, that can do anything on the CPU, coordinating with a thousand math savants in another room, uh, but they get, you've got to use a slow connection here, you know, tin cans and a string kind of connection. But the savants in the other room can really number crunch a whole lot if you give them a simple enough problem. This is GPU, you know, programming in a nutshell. Uh, this is the kind of thing we do in our open ICC workshop um, with the same problems that you're going to use here in the MPI workshop. Another approach, uh, oh, by the way, the way we can do this could either be with a typical classic approach of doing this is using something called CUDA, which is very low level and uh, non-standard at all and not portable and it's a maintenance nightmare because CUDA gets updates every you know, 15 months or so 
uh, and, and it really requires a lot of maintenance. Or you could use a directive-based approach like OpenMP, the OpenSC version of it, which means you give some hints to the compiler and you hope it can do a whole lot of the smarts to make this stuff happen magically behind the scenes. And that, that's not an unreasonable expectation for a lot of scientific type algorithms. But what we're going to learn instead is we're going to learn how to do this so that we can really scale this thing up infinitely, in a sense. We can scale this thing up as large as we want because four cores on your laptop, breaking the map up into four pieces, probably isn't going to be enough. If you're the National Weather Service, that's not going to get you an accurate forecast and hurricane predictions. Uh, a single GPU is, might be faster than your CPU, but still, you're not going to run a serious weather model on it. You need, you, you sit down and you do the math, you say, how many flops do I need in order to get my prediction out tomorrow instead of five years from now? Uh, and the answer is probably going to be that you need thousands and thousands or tens of thousands, of course, worth of flops. You need a lot of flops to do water, modern weather modeling. And so MPI is going to give us that capability. MPI says instead, let's break up the problem across a bunch of different physically independent machines. A cluster of machines might be a good place to start. So, and you can certainly build your own cluster. You buy a bunch of, I call them white boxes, right, as a term for buying a bunch of generic workstations. Buy a bunch of workstations and stick them in a closet, hook them together with Ethernet, you've got yourself a cluster. So you could build a cluster like that, or you can find yourself a supercomputer. We'll find out MPI makes all these things look pretty much alike from the programming perspective. So you build yourself a cluster, and now you can get as much computing flops as you need in one place, as much as you can afford. If you can afford, you have more money, you buy twice as many machines. So as much computing power as you need, you can keep scaling it up. But our computing model now requires us to break this map up into a lot of small independent pieces that live on each one of these separate machines in their own separate memory on those machines. And they only communicate between themselves over an actual visible network, an Ethernet network, for example, or, you know, you, that, you, that you're using to connect them together. So this is where MPI comes into play. MPI says, okay, we can break this map up into 50 different pieces if we want, one for each state. And each one of those states is going to have its own workstation. So it only has to compute for one small state, but it's got to talk and communicate that weather information with the other states because, you know, the weather, you are affected by your neighbor, you know, to, to some degree, right? The weather does come across the border. So we do need to exchange some information, and that's going to have to happen over, over the network. MPI allows us to do this model. So this is like having 50 meteorologists, but they're no longer in the same room, just looking at the same map, staring over each other's shoulders. Now they have to explicitly communicate. So it's like having 50 meteorologists using a telegraph. So this is a little bit uh, more attention. We've got to pay the detail. Uh, it's going to, to require more effort on our part to make this work, but it will scale as large as we can afford, basically. And this is MPI, and I won't go into this because we're about to. We're about to jump right into these details. So here, this is how the pieces fit together. If you understand this right here, you understand the vast majority of the actual real computing landscape. There are lots and lots, and we'll talk about this tomorrow in the outro talk, there are lots of experimental and, you know, and hyped ways to do parallel programming, and we'll dive into it tomorrow. I don't want to confuse you now before you know one that actually works, MPI. After we do MPI tomorrow, we'll look at a lot of these other, you might have heard somebody say, well, if you do functional programming, it makes all this stuff work out automatically. You know, just do, you know, ask out, it'll all happen. Uh, you may have heard things like that. We'll look at those uh, uh, claims tomorrow, but I can tell you right now that the reality at the moment is that 99 plus percent of computing done on supercomputers is done with the pieces that we've just co covered right now, and I'll show you how they fit together. That's the reality. So if you go to uh, Supercomputing 18, a conference that takes place uh, next month uh, in, in Dallas this year, and you walk the, the large show floor there and look at the thousands of projects that people are doing, 99 plus percent of the ones that are running on supercomputers use MPI, GPU programming, and OpenMP. So the, the, this is the reality. The, possibilities for the future are a different story, and we'll talk about those tomorrow. But the reality of the pieces look like this, is that today if you buy a processor, it's going to have multiple cores. You can't buy a serial processor anymore. So even a simple ARM processor to, to power your iWatch has got multiple cores. So you buy a processor today, it's got multiple cores. If you want to program those multiple cores, you need multi-threaded programming. OpenMP is, is by far the biggest standard for doing that. Uh, so OpenMP allows you to use multiple cores. If you buy a GPU to plug into your whatever you've got, your workstation, so if we buy a workstation to do some computing and we decide we want to buy some more flops, like say you go on Amazon, you buy yourself a 
a voltage GPU and you plug it in and now all of a sudden you've got teraflops of performance, 100 teraflops if you're willing to go low precision of performance that you just bought and plugged in. If you want to program that, you need some kind of GPU programming approach like OpenACC. But if that's not sufficient, if that one box, no matter how much money you put into it, isn't sufficient, then with, you have no other choice and this is, again, this is where, I, you know, this, this is not uh, my, a matter of preference, editorial <coughs> preference, this is a matter of reality. If you look at all the large codes out there that run on tens of thousands of cores, all of them use MPI, that you're about to learn. So if we want to go beyond a single box, a single node, we need MPI to put those pieces together. And so MPI allows us to scale things up to, uh, to you know, infinite scale in a sense. I mean, and, that, and there, there really isn't the ceiling there, and that it does come down to is as much money as you have. And we can see this in the trajectory over the years that we're up to now tens of millions of cores. I'll, I'll show you that on some of the bigger machines. They're all MPI. There's no other way to program these big machines MPI. There's no, there are no alternatives that are viable at the moment. Lots of discussion, lots of hopes and dreams, but how all the codes that are running on the big machines right now, they are MPI codes. Okay, so let's, let's recap here at some of the levels of parallelism we have going on. We can start, as I mentioned, at the lowest level on modern processors, we have these vector instructions that we don't get into because we hope that the compiler takes care of it for us, and that's, that's not an unreasonable hope. Uh, it's, it's good to know optimization and to talk with somebody that knows optimization and maybe verify that you're getting good performance out of this and run profilers on your code. But you might hope that the compiler does a good job of using this stuff at the lowest level. The instruction parallelism uh, in modern processors is incredibly complex and sophisticated. This is, by the way, where all these uh, specter and meltdown problems come up, you know, all these security things that you may, or may have heard of in the past year. Uh, and are difficult to eliminate because modern processors do have a lot of uh, bag of tricks that are, are quite effective. That's why, you know, Intel is kind of, it's not an easy problem for them to solve to get rid of all these because they're giving up a lot of performance. But these things all happen in the background. There are all these clever tricks for rearranging the orders and instructions and renaming registers and deciding what's likely to happen in your code. But this happens at, at some level that's between the hardware and the compiler again. So we hope as programmers this stuff doesn't really have to be visible to us. We hope it's all the compiler and not your problem. Again, that's not always true. Sometimes it's helpful to be able to jump in here and give the compiler some, uh, some uh, hints as to how it might do better. Uh, sometimes it can be quite effective. Uh, it's always good to at least have a handle on how well you're doing here. That's why running a profiler on your code is a nice thing to do. Uh, but we, we can have an, uh, it's not unreasonable to hope that this, this stuff can remain invisible to us. On the other hand, once you start talking about using more than one core, because you know your processor, whatever it is, whether it's your laptop in front of you or some other machine, it's got multiple cores in it. We know that to use multiple cores, we've got to do that. The compiler can't do that effectively. We've got to program it. So we could use OpenMP and worry about programming on multiple cores here. Uh, if we plug in an accelerator, like a GPU, or there are some alternatives to, to GPUs, but GPUs are, are pretty much the center of mass of of accelerator program. If we plug in an accelerator, we could program that in some way. But if we want to go beyond that at all, to do anything larger than a single node, then we're in the MPI world. Now there are a few other things that are important in parallel programming that I won't go into. We don't have time to cover everything, but uh, next couple of days. But they're important. Parallel I/O, for example, is incredibly effective and important for these large machines. If you've got uh, if you built yourself a big cluster and it's got thousands of nodes or more, uh, doing I.O., reading your data in for your problem and writing it out as you, you do your computations is something that's, that's not trivial at that point, and you hope that happens in parallel as well. It's essential that it does, or you're, you know, so you ran your problem a thousand times faster, but it takes you two days to read your data. So I.O. Is, uh, is a whole thing that, that happens in parallel. We'll touch upon, MPI is a, a good way to deal with that issue too, so we'll touch upon it briefly. MPI is a great solution for this problem, but doing I.O. in parallel is important. Uh, also, for some of you out there, uh, you know, there are these more or less custom, exotic type of devices that can be very effective in certain classes of problems. They're either straight up custom chips like ASICs, or they're fill programmable gate arrays that you can kind of reprogram to do your thing, or digital signal processors that are very good at particular types of problems. So some of you out there will undoubtedly come across these kind of devices and how to program them. They also fit into this scheme in various ways, but I, I can't digress, you know, into, into the particulars here. Uh, uh, but these are, these are other areas of parallel programming that you come across and are important at scale. But uh, let's look at how MPI applies as we kind of, you know, work our way up the hierarchy of machines here. If you buy a motherboard, uh, you know, or you look at the motherboard that you bought for your workstation in there, uh, 
for the cheap motherboards, the kind that you have on your, your on, in your laptop or in your, you know, your typical home PC, even if you're a builder, probably just has one chip in it, one processor. That processor has multiple cores, but it's only got one processor. If you look at a data center, on the other hand, uh, they typically want to cram more performance per, uh, per processor or per blade that they stick in their cabinets in their data centers. And so they typically have multi-socket motherboards. So you can stick in dual or even quad processors on a single motherboard and, and get a lot more cores on a board that way. You can start to stick a lot of this stuff together and build a larger machine. You can even try to build a shared memory machine that's very large where all the cores share the same pool of memory. And this is desirable because it allows us to use that OpenMP programming model that I briefly mentioned earlier. I, I said it's good for doing like four cores to break our weather map up into. Well, that programming model is definitely easier than MPI. What you're about to learn with MPI, and some of you undoubtedly have been, been told how intimidating and difficult MPI is, and I'll dispel that. We're going to find out. We're going to turn you into MPI programmers over the next day, uh, and so you'll walk away saying, well, that wasn't that, that hard to do. But it, uh, it is a little bit harder than something like OpenMP, so the desire to use OpenMP, the OpenMP programming model, would just throw a few directives at loops kind of approach, which, which can be effective. The desire to retain that programming model on bigger machines uh, beyond a single node is such that people occasionally, companies try to build very large shared memory machines. And so there are some very large shared memory machines out there. Uh, we have on bridges some of these 12 terabyte nodes. They've got 12 terabytes and 260 cores. That's about as large as it gets with shared memory. But you, you can't hope to push the envelope some. So, so shared memory machines can be more than four cores or 28 cores. They, they can be larger, but they're very expensive. And even then, when you're willing to spend millions of dollars, that's it. That's the limit. So you're, you're still stuck at several hundred cores. You're never going to go uh, uh, up to the scale of, well, a cluster that you might build yourself. So there are lots of clusters out there that people have built over the, over the decades since cluster computing became popular back in the, in the mid-90s because if, you've, you know, if you want to build your own parallel computer, nobody can stop you from just sticking a lot of, of uh, nodes in one place and cooking them together the network. And you might, you might put them in nice cabinets uh, as, you know, as blades or instead of having, a, as I implied earlier, a, you know, a room somewhere, an unused room where you threw a bunch of white boxes on the floor and strung them together. But at the end of the day, it's the same thing. It's the same idea that it's a conventional uh, computing box hooked up through a network connection to a bunch more conventional computing boxes. And there are lots of big clusters out there, all of which are programmed with MPI. And if you've got the, uh, the money to have somebody do the slickest uh, solution for you, they can start to make custom networks to cram things even closer together. Physical proximity with networks can be helpful for speed purposes. Uh, you know, the speed of light actually becomes important. Uh, cooling becomes tougher. So all these things that, that, that come into play when you want to build a custom machine are the reasons why people do buy machines from Cray, for example, or a big vendor. Uh, and if you do that, you can build yourself an MPP, a massively parallel processor, at whatever scale you can afford. And so at the moment, the biggest machines in the world, for example, are Summit at Oak Ridge National Lab. It's 122 petaflops. So we've been talking about the race to exascale or exaflops. Well, this is you know, about an eighth of the way there. Uh, and, uh, and it's got a bunch of pieces. And we won't go into the pieces, but it's got 2.2 2 .2 million cores. So this is where you as an MPI programmer get to go, ah, oh, this is awesome, millions of cores to use, as compared to somebody that's not an MPI programmer to whom this is completely inaccessible. Uh, the, the second place machine, it was in the number one spot for the past couple of years, is a Chinese machine that's got 10 million cores in it. It's got a custom interconnect. It's got a lot of custom stuff going on in it. Okay, before we move on, uh, I want to I want to clarify some terminology here. It's important because we're going to be using banding this stuff about for the next uh, next day or so, uh, and it's easy to get confused. As a matter of fact, it's easy because people that use this terminology often use it in a confusing and not consistent manner. Including I'm guilty of it as as, as well. So what are these terms, cores and nodes and processors, and one that we haven't used yet called PEs, but we surely will use? What do these terms mean? Well, nodes refers to an actual uh, physical board that you've you know, got either in your cabinet or your workstation that's sitting on the floor in your closet, a physical board that has a network connection to it. So it's the, it's the node at the end of a network. So anything that's got its own network connection, no matter how much computing power is lumped in there, it might have multiple sockets in there with a bunch of cores. It might just be one core with you know, 12, uh, one socket with 12 cores in it and one processor. So a node is basically anything that's got its own network endpoint. That's a node. 
Uh, and again, in a modern data center that you're going to walk into and, you know, big warehouse full of cabinet after cabinet after cabinet, the node amounts to one of those blades that you'll pull out of the cabinet. On that blade, you will find a physical chip. That's a processor. So the processor should always refer to a physical chip, basically something you can order off Amazon. You go, I want to buy a faster version of my processor for my workstation, and you get a chip and you plug it in the socket. That is a processor. Now, processors today have multiple cores, always. So the core is the actual independent little CPU on that processor, within that processor, that can run its own program. So a core is basically this thing that can independently run its own program and doesn't care what the other cores are doing theoretically uh, and can run a serial program off on its own. That's a core. And last, because these terms are thrown about and, and used interchangeably where they shouldn't be so much, people that do a lot of parallel programming uh, long ago came up with the term processing element, or PE is how it's often abbreviated, and we'll use this actually in our codes. Uh, and a PE basically says, okay, whatever, however you put together this machine that you've built, however many processors it is and nodes and everything else, each one of the pieces of that machine, it can run its own separate serial thread. Let's call that a PE, a processing element. And so PE is a nice term that gets rid of uh, an ambiguity here and the misuse of processor and core in particular. So we'll call things a PE as long as they can run their own separate program. So if we looked at a big uh, MPP in a data center somewhere, we'd go in, we'd walk in the door and say, oh my God, this thing has, it's got 200 cabinets in here. Each one of those cabinets has a dozen blades in it. If we pull out one of those blades, it's got two processors on it. And if we look in each one of those processors, it's got a dozen cores. Well, then our PEs then would be each one of those cores inside there. And we could say if we do the math and do all the multiplication I just made happen, we could say, oh, we've got uh, 200,000 cores in this room. And so, or excuse me, 200,000 PEs in this room. So PEs is what we'll, we'll think of in terms of ultimately the thing that we can separately have running its own piece of our weather map or anything else that we break our problem up into. Uh, and I may be guilty of of misusing the terminology here and there, but through context, you can usually tell, tell what I mean or what anybody else means. That's why people do abuse the terminology so much. The network we're going to find out with MPI is, is largely hidden from us. We're not going to have to worry about it because it's a wonderful thing about MPI. It's going to make the network from the programming perspective mostly go away if we wanted to. We, can, we could delve into it if we wanted, but in general, you want your codes to be pretty portable and you want to move them back and forth. But of course, the actual network does have performance implications. Just because our software abstracts it away doesn't mean it, it's, it's not really there affecting things. Uh, and so you should understand a couple of simple things about the networks that connect things together. Uh, and these couple simple things I'll point out to you will suffice to give you a pretty good understanding of how they perform. We could dive into lower level in lots more detail, but unless you're building the machine or the network, you probably don't care. But to understand uh, the, the general performance of a network, we only need a couple things. You only need to understand the latency, the bandwidth, and the shape or the topology of the network. The latency of a network is basically the, the time lag to send a very small message between any node and any other node. So you can define it as a zero byte message. So the smallest message you can send between one node and another node, that's the latency. And if you've got a code that's sending lots of small messages, that latency might be the dominant factor that determines its performance. If the network's got poor latency, it's going to spend a lot of time waiting for these little messages to come across. On the other hand, let's say you've got a code that doesn't send many messages, but they're very huge. Each one of the messages has a lot of data in it. In that case, you're more concerned about the bandwidth. So the bandwidth is the speed at which megabytes per second, gigabytes per second, is at which your messages can be sent between uh, any two nodes in the network. And so if we graph the time it takes to send a message, we can see it's got this latency attached to it, and then depending on the size of it, the bandwidth determines how long it's going to take. So some applications, you send a lot of small messages. Some applications, you send uh, large messages. So latency or bandwidth can have <coughs> a very importance for you. The actual connections, the shape of the connections between these things is also very important because that will determine ultimately uh, how much the messages more or less interfere with each other. Give you a quick example of, of how these things have evolved in the sophisticated pieces they are. If you build your own network with uh, Ethernet, it's kind of a baseline way to throw together a quick cluster. Uh, and probably any of you working in computer labs, you probably have actually Ethernet connecting things together. You basically take your Ethernet and you daisy chain everything together and you've got one wire connecting everything. And that's convenient because if I get another workstation, I can just plop it down and run the Ethernet to it and everybody's happy. 
Uh, so this is a nice way to put, throw together a computer cluster. And it works fine as long as you know, uh, one person here is browsing the internet, and another person here is uh, doing a little bit of programming, and another person here is uh, watching a movie. If we're all doing different things at different times. This network can keep us all happy. However, most programs, parallel programs, don't have that kind of asynchronous random behavior. Instead, things like our weather map tend to have the exact opposite behavior. We tend to, on our weather map, do a lot of computing to compute the weather, and then at the end of our time step, so we just computed what the weather's like at, you know, 1.03 a.m., you know, on this day. Now we want to move on to 1.04 a.m. for the next time step on our weather map, and at that point, we all want to exchange information with our immediate neighbors. So at that point, we're all trying to use a network at the same time, and something like an Ethernet here gets overwhelmed and becomes a bottleneck. And so the networks can easily be bottlenecked by parallel codes. It's the number one problem we have to worry about when we're designing a network. And it will happen with something like an Ethernet routinely because it's, it's not designed for this kind of uh, pattern where everybody wants to communicate at once. So instead, we'd build a network like this. We'd have each one of our, our uh, PCs connected to each one of the other ones independently. And then if these two want to communicate, these two can communicate without interfering. And that's great. And nobody can argue that complete connectivity is a fantastic network. It just turns out to be completely impractical to build at any kind of large scale because of the way that the number of connections scales. So, uh, you know, basically n squared. So if we had, a, you know, a thousand nodes here, we'd need half a million connections between it. So you can't build any reasonable size cluster with complete connectivity. But it is the ideal. So it's, it's always the ideal, you know, that everything's independently connected. You can try to fake it. And if you build a small cluster, you'll buy something typically called a crossbar. And a crossbar tries to fake complete connectivity. It's the central point that tries to look, maintain the appearance that every node's independently connected to every other node. But the reality is, there's still some saturation limit in here, <clears throat> and it can happen in various ways, uh, that, that ends up putting that, uh, that, that uh, lie to the test whenever, again, in a scientific code, all the nodes want to communicate at once. And so you hit that saturation point, and then you find out that a crossbar isn't actually a completely connected network. So what do engineers do to try to get around this <clears throat> is they build tree networks. The simplest tree network you could build would be a binary tree. So a binary tree would basically be our compute nodes here at the bottom, and these are our network routers here to, to connect the nodes up above. And any node here can talk with any other node on this network, and it's, you know, it's a nice feature of it. It's also nice that if we had a, a network, we had a cluster of four nodes, and we wanted to make it bigger, we just buy four more nodes here and some more networking hardware, and we plop it down next to it, and we connect it up. We've got a bigger cluster, right? So trees are nice, and they grow uh, in an in a, in a incremental fashion. Uh, they're, so it's all nice so far, so good. The problem is that we end up with this top point in the network becoming oversaturated with communications because it has to support the communications between this entire half of the machine and this half, entire half of the machine. As a matter of fact, this problem of communicating across the middle of the machine as we scale things up it has a term called the bisection bandwidth to characterize it that basically gives you an idea, as the term suggests, if we bisect the machine, What's the bandwidth that we have available to us? Because that's really the concern if you build a big tree network, is do I have enough bandwidth at the bisection point, the worst point in my network, to support all the communications that takes place between this half of the machine and this half of the machine? And if the network looks like this, the answer is going to be no. The larger we build this network, the more this top point gets stressed out without relief. So instead, we build a fat tree. And a fat tree is where we add in more connections as we go further up in the network to relieve that congestion. So here, all, all these little boxes at the bottom here are the compute nodes, and these circles are network connection points. And so in this case here, as we go further up in the network, we have more and more connections to try to, to relieve this congestion at the top. And this is a factory, and it's, it's a very successful way of dealing with this problem. Uh, but the formula that you have for how many more connections should we have at the top is something that is a, is a parameter you can adjust. How many connections you have going up and down, and how many cross connections you have, is something that you can vary. And so if we look at the topologies of these various factories, we'll find different ones out there in the wild. Here are some, some machines that have been somewhat well-known, large machines over the years. And if we graph their uh, topologies out, you can see that they have different patterns to them. And they, they have different performance characteristics. Some of them are good at things like broadcasting, and some of them are things, good at things like gathering data. All of the things we'll find out MPI uh, will allow us to do. So uh, network topologies can be very sophisticated, and they're constantly evolving. It's not a solved problem by any means. 
Uh, depends on the, the balance you want to give uh, in your machine. And there are new ideas and designs coming out all the time. Things like Dragonfly networks now are, are becoming quite trendy. At any rate, uh, this is an ongoing area of, uh, of research and hardware evolution. So what about this, the very crude 3D torus, which also is the other alternative to fat tree. So basically, if we look at large networks, they're going to be a fat tree or they're going to be a torus. And a torus which is a 3D torus, is, uh, again, not sophisticated at all compared to a fat tree. It is just a 3D grid. Now, the nice thing about a 3D grid is that it tends to map pretty well to a lot of scientific problems, which is a 3D problem you've got, like our weather map, right? Our weather is actually, it's actually 3D. We've been looking at it as 2D, but it's a 3D problem. Right? We've got a 3D problem. We break it up into a bunch of pieces. It's going to map pretty well to this network. So a 3D torus is a nice way to, uh, to map our problem. Uh, right onto the network and make sure that the data communications is going to be efficient. Our nearest neighbor is Pennsylvania communicates with Ohio. It's got one network connection. It's not interfering with down here with some uh, with, with uh, Pennsylvania on the other side communicating with uh, Jersey. So we've got a lot of nice characteristics of mapping a 3D torus into a problem. By the way, the torus term corresponds to the fact that it's nice to not have to tunnel data back through the middle of the network, so we actually wrap the ends around. I haven't drawn the connection here, but A and B actually have this wrap-around connection on the outside. That's what makes it a torus, it's just a 3D grid. And that's a nice characteristic, so you'll find that in, in all of these things. Uh, so 3D toruses and fat trees represent the networks that you're going to build at large scale. <clears throat> if you come across clusters or build your own cluster, it will maybe have something like a cross bar network in it, or people today increasingly are getting sophisticated in building trees, even on relatively small uh, clusters. Uh, so these are the networks that you're going to find with MPI, uh, with MPI codes. We're going to find out that MPI hides most of this from us, but again, you should at least be aware of the fact that the shape of the network, the, the bandwidth of the network, and the latency of the network are going to have an impact depending on, on the performance, depending on what your MPI is asking of the network. Uh, I mentioned briefly GPU architectures are different. I won't go into them here. I just figured I'd, I'd at least throw the slides up here so you can see this. In the GPU architectures are uh, uh, the cores, the many thousands of cores that we have going on on a modern GPU, which will have you know 4,000 or more cores and 6,000 cores. The cores are extremely simple. They're not real full-blown CPUs. They can't run independent threads. Uh, so we won't dive into that, that here, nor Intel's approach to that. So instead, let's look at uh, the top 10 systems. There's a top 10 list that comes out twice a year, and the last version of it was in June. And uh, it, these are the top 10 machines in the world. It's based on a benchmark that you may or may not think is applicable to you, the impact benchmark. But at any rate, you need some benchmark to, 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 to in common to rate these machines. And if we look at these top 10 machines in the world right now, you'll see that they all have you know, hundreds of thousands of cores, some of them 10 million cores right here. All of this implies, doesn't I mean, explicitly says to anybody that knows what they're looking at here, these are MPI machines. You program these machines with MPI. If you don't use MPI in these machines, you can't run things at scale on these machines. You probably shouldn't be on these machines at all. Uh, they all have some, well, not all of them, about half of them have accelerators of some sort or another. If we look here, have some NVIDIA things stuck in here. Here's NVIDIA, NVIDIA, here's Intel Xeon Phi. That's Intel's version of, a, of an accelerator. So there's a lot of accelerators going on in here, too. So that's in the mix. Uh, that's an important thing to note if you do want to use a, a certain portions of these machines. Being able to program an accelerator, a GPU, is, is important. Uh, and uh, I think that's, that's all we'll go into here outside of, again, to point out the fact that if you're an MPI programmer, you can use these machines. If you're not an MPI programmer, you probably aren't allowed on these machines. Uh, parallel I.O., again, we won't go into any more detail here. So last thing I'll talk about here is where this stuff is headed so that you have some idea of the roadmap in the immediate future that I can pretty much guarantee. I'm not going to go into a lot of speculation here. Instead, I'll show you where things where the, in the, either the momentum or the outright funding and roadmaps are in place to guarantee what things look like for the next couple of years. So we, the rise now for a couple of years is very definite. Uh, and maybe for five or six years out, you can make some pretty good guarantees as well. And MPI is a big part of all of that. So today, petaflops computing is, is everywhere. There's a, well over 270 machines that have breached the petaflop uh, barrier. So lots of that. Everybody's got an exascale project going on in you know, every substantial region right now worrying about getting to exascale. So again, here's exascale to put it in a, a different perspective. The world's biggest machine in 2004 was Cray Red Storm. Uh, this is equal to 23,000 of those machines. 
Uh, or today, if you've got, here's a, a middle of the road, mid-link kind of uh, GPU that you're liable to find around your uh, department, uh, an NVIDIA K, K40. It's 1.2 teraflops. It's equivalent to 833,000 of those. So these, these are big machines. The reason, again, I showed you briefly earlier a graph of this, the reason that we, we're pretty sure we're getting there soon is because, you know, we've got the, the history here behind us showing us, you know, kind of incremental progress we're making. It's not hard to extrapolate out a couple of years. And at one point in time, we were pretty sure that we were going to get there. So this machine on the bottom is the fastest machine. This, this is the fastest machine. Uh, this is the cumulative sum of all these machines right here. Uh, excuse me, this is the uh, 500 machine. This is the slowest machine on the 500 list. This is the, the fastest machine on the list. We're pretty sure we're going to get to right here, an exaflop right around uh, 2020. But if you kind of read into this a little bit, if you want to do a little bit of regression on these, this data here, you can see that we're kind of tailing off here a little bit. Now we're guessing more like around 2021, 2022, uh, we're going to have that first uh, uh, machine show up. But, uh, but it's very competitive. Could be some surprises along the way. I'll skip this slide here. I'll point out some of the obstacles in the future, though, uh, that, that you know, are affecting this roadmap. Uh, and there are of the groups that do these, these exascale roadmaps that are trying to deploy exascale machines. Some of them have come forward with, uh, made public their, their kind of list of priorities and concerns, things, obstacles that have to be uh, surmounted before they're going to get there. And uh, these are some of them right here. Uh, energy efficiency, actually, energy and cooling and everything else is, is extremely important and difficult at that scale. We're talking about machines that are going to use more than 20 megawatts of power, at least 20 megawatts of power uh, to power them. Uh, lots of problems with, uh, with reliability. When you've got millions of processors in one place, keeping them going uh, is, well, it's impossible, actually. If you think about the mean time between failure, if I told you a processor only fails once every 10 years, you might think, oh, that's, that's not bad performance. But if you put 10 million of them in one place, it means they're not all going to keep going for even a couple of hours at a time. So building a big machine with, with 10 million cores means fault tolerance, reliability, and everything become not afterthoughts if you want to use the whole machine. Uh, so lots of problems like this. This is, this is a list put forward by uh, the, the uh, Advanced Scientific Computing Advisory Committee, for example. Uh, so for those of you that are interested, you can stare at this list and say what problems actually might you want to contribute to. If you're interested in being on the leading edge of this stuff, there's a lot of opportunity to help contribute to solving these problems. Um, and they're outstanding problems still. So it's not like the exascale machines are some inevitable evolution. We're just going to keep cranking away. These problems are between us and making those machines effective. The, uh, the roadmap to get there has had a couple of uh, quantum jumps on it, one of which has happened, one of which we're in the midst of. The first one that happened was the first boost, if we look at the top 500 list over time, if it going up. If you look at it closely, it's had a couple of jumps here that have happened. The first one was back when accelerators uh, became popular. That, that really kept the momentum going. As, as the serial performance petered out around 2004, you know, but this top 500 list data over the past decades kept marching forward somehow. Well, the first thing that really kept things on track was the boost from accelerators, because GPUs really helped to bring a lot of flops in these machines. The second boost, which is taking place pretty much right now, is the move to 3D circuitry and electronics. Uh, and this has happened industry-wide in commodity devices as well, which is stacked electronics. Uh, this has become really, really important because Moore's law, you know, gives us the, this density on a single chip, but stacking those chips on top of each other uh, is and it's not a trivial thing. We're not talking about stacking them at some package level. We're talking about stacking silicon dyes on silicon dyes. Uh, stacking them 3D has brought us, brought us uh, continued performance improvements that kind of hit hide Moore's loss issues at the moment. So the increased bandwidths and things that have kept chugging along, a lot of it's due to 3D packaging. That's happening now. The third boost, which uh, may be needed to get us the next scale machine, is moving to silicon photonics, which is uh, uh, basically saying that copper you know, wires to connect everything together have a, a lot of drawbacks to them. Uh, doing things fiber optics is you know, obviously superior in many, many ways. Right? We know that our, our big networks, our wide scale networks are all fiber optic now. Uh, many of you have fiber coming into your home. Well, fiber optic connections at the network level on these big machines are becoming commonplace, but maybe, maybe to the integrated circuit level are really important to, to, to get those benefits uh, if we want to, to get the network efficiencies that we need to build these exascale machines. So these are, these are important quantum jumps in technology uh, that, that show up at the bleeding edge and then filter their way back down to your desktop. Uh, 
one, one really interesting thing that's a little bit wonkish, a little bit technically specific, but it's, I think it's, it's actually really nifty in that MPI people get a huge benefit from what for everybody else is a huge problem. And that is that if we look at where the power is actually being spent in modern computing, it used to be that uh, almost all the power was spent in scientific computing actually doing the number crunching. Actual, if you looked at it, getting, getting the data in the registers uh, to, to get the answer out of it, doing the number crunching was where all the power in a processor went, all the power in your machine went, doing, doing the flops, the number crunching. Today, we've hit this point where most of the power is now spent moving data around on the machine. The actual computing, number crunching part of computing, is the least amount of power, whereas moving data between all the memories, because you've got all these memory hierarchies and network connections and everything else, has now become the dominant consumer of power. So data movement is now the biggest consumer of power as of this year. And so uh, MPI, as you're about to learn, we haven't learned it yet, but we're about to learn, MPI gives us control over where we move the data. And so most people are fearful of this future in which controlling data movement becomes really important to getting good performance out of these machines or even making it possible. As an MPI programmer, you're actually, you have the capability, whether you want it or not, it's a responsibility in MPI programming to control the data movement. And so as the world becomes more fixated on moving the data around for efficiency's sake instead of just going computing, uh, doing the number crunching in the registers, uh, you as MPI programmers are really in a good position to, to, to deal with that problem. We'll come back to that briefly after you know what MPI is, uh, which, which will be shortly if you're not. Uh, so another way of looking at that is that if the flops, if the floating point operations actually are free at some point because they're taking little of the power and all of your time is spent moving operations around on the machine, then you know, eventually we're going to worry about optimizing data movement. Not eventually, it's already happening more than anything else. And uh, MPI is well positioned to do that. Okay, I won't belabor these points. These are, again, it's a, uh, another way of looking at the old constraints that used to, to be the main problems in programming, uh, things like how fast is your clock and how many flops are you using on things, uh, to now, uh, in, in modern machines now, it's instead power, as I've mentioned, data movement, as I just mentioned, concurrency, using these things in parallel is now the most important thing in programming, and that's where, with MPI, you're well positioned. Uh, memory scaling. Uh, computing ca capabilities grown way faster than the memory bandwidth. So that's related to the data movement, too, having your data in the right place. MPI is well positioned to deal with that. Locality. Where is your data? In, you know, in a modern machine, you've got from the CPU, you've got registers, and you've got these multiple caches to get the data into before you hit regular memory. Now in modern machines, now we've got the, behind the regular memory, we've got non-volatile type of memories, flash memories, things like that, SSDs, uh, then ultimately maybe some disks, spinning disks, long-term stuff. Where is your data sitting in that hierarchy? Where, where should it be? These are things MPI is particularly well developed to, to, to deal with. A data locality. Uh, heterogeneity, saying that, you know, I showed you a top 10 list. These machines have, uh, have processors, they've got accelerators in them, they've got multiple processors on each node, uh, multiple cores on each processor. So the machine's not some regular, you know, simple building block. It's got a lot of pieces and moving parts to it. So these are all the things that MPI uh, is, is well placed to deal with. Last one is not. It's still very much an outstanding problem, the reliability thing I mentioned to you. Okay. Uh, Another last thing I'll mention, because if we're going to talk about architectures, uh, if you're, if you're uh, either keeping up with stuff or you're going to dive into this field, you'll quickly find out that people are interested in architectures that are different than what we're doing today, substantially different, not just a rearrangement of the pieces that we're using today. Today we're doing things with standard silicon electronics, CMOS electronics, if you will. That's the kind of silicon fabrication technique that almost everything today is based on. And our computers look pretty much the same as they did from the first computers we built in the 1940s, a von Neumann architecture. Basically, you've got registers and you've got memory, and you move things back and forth between the two. And that's where we are today. But maybe the answer to the end of Moore's law is instead something drastically different. What if we go beyond silicon transistors? So we keep the architectures we've got today. We've got our registers and our, you know, we, we keep kind of computers we've got now, but we build them onto something that's higher performance and doesn't have these thermodynamic issues and, and whatnot. Uh, things like graphene, for example. People are, are trying to make transistors out of, out of graphene. Uh, you, the, that is uh, an a incredibly obviously desirable thing. It preserves a lot of the technology and techniques that we have, but allows us to continue to move forward without Moore's law. 
or to at least reset Moore's law into some other different domain. Uh, so there's a lot of hope for that, but those things are still pretty much in the laboratory. When you read about graphene transistors, it's some, sitting on a lab bench somewhere. It's, it's not in fabrication. How about if we abandon the von Neumann architecture and go for something that's radically different design, something like quantum computing? This has certainly got an awful lot of mind share in the world of computing. So we, we're going to do something that's uh, certainly not silicon-based electronics, uh, and it's certainly not a von Neumann architecture. It's very different, but maybe it gets us a whole different world of capability. Quantum computing is a, is a fascinating, interesting area. Uh, maybe one of the most interesting things about it is the more you learn about it, well, I should say the people that are, are most expert in this field have very, very diverse opinions on how, when the near-term practicability is going to materialize, on how soon any of this is going to be real, how close we are to actual real devices and real applications. Uh, it is unusual in that respect. Usually, right, it, you can, you, as you get towards uh, the experts and knowledgeable people, a consensus kind of forms, uh, that is not the case here. You will find that people who are, are deeply involved in this field have very differing views about whether we're a couple of years away from some practical quantum computing, at least in some narrow domains, or whether we're 15 years away. Uh, and you'll hear both of those opinions from people that are, are well informed. Um, not just from somebody that's getting secondhand information. So it's a very interesting and rapidly developing area. Uh, and uh, a lot of literature is accessible to you for those of you who are interested in it, but hard to, hard to predict. Uh, and the, the last alternative that's worth, I think, talking about, it's got any, any practical uh, reality of coming to bear, is something that uses our modern electronics techniques, CMOS electronics, silicon-based electronics, but a very von, different non-von Neumann design, like neuromorphic computing, is the practical example of building a computer that looks, in this case, like a neural net. Uh, machine learning, deep learning, has become uh, wildly successful in many different areas, uh, and it's based upon building in, in software, basically, and using GPUs, building these architectures that look, resemble something like biological neural, uh, neural nets. Um, the idea that we could instead implement that directly in silicon and thereby uh, remove kind of the, the need for this, this translation uh, is, is not only irresistible, but it's also practical. And it turns out that there are more than a few companies from IBM on out that are developing neuromorphic computing devices, uh, which have had varying degrees of, of actual real-world effectiveness. So here's a different type of computing that is built on silicon electronics. So how to fabricate, it's not an unknown. That's not iffy. They can definitely do it. Uh, how much success they'll have in varying, uh, varying applications is still an open question, but it certainly has had some early successes. So Moore's Law is not necessarily the end, and nor should we be freaked out that Moore's Law is coming to an end because it's not the first paradigm shift in computing. We've just got very, very uh, spoiled by this integrated circuit era. Uh, computing came out of you know, mechanical devices with hauler cards to do you know, uh, census surveys and things. And the first computers were built with relay-type electronics and then vacuum tubes and then independent transistors. So you know, computing went through a lot of upheaval and a lot of revolutions over the years. It's just we've been stuck since the late 60s in this integrated circuit era. And we, we think that's all there is to computing, but it's, we're kind of overdue in that sense for a paradigm shift. It wouldn't be the first. Um, there's also uh, now finally a big appreciation out there of the need to, since Moore's Law isn't giving us the ability to just go, okay, however poor your programming is or your approach is, it'll run faster next year. Computing time is cheap compared to developer time or productivity time. Now, that was a, a mantra that became quite popular over the past 20, 20 some years as we took it for granted that computing power was so cheap and was just boundlessly growing. Uh, over the past five or six years, there's been more of a realization that eh, maybe we need to actually go back to, to knowing how to program because you know, things aren't just randomly speeding up anymore. And that uh, saying that my code's fast enough, even though it's using 2% of the capability, that's OK on your laptop. But if you're going to run something in the cloud, which means somebody's data center somewhere, if you're going to run something in a data center uh, you know, uh, that's taking megawatts to run, then saying it's running at 2% of its potential speed because I didn't have time to do it right is incredibly wasteful. All right? So there's, there's that shift, too. Uh, and you as, uh, as MPI programmers are, are, are well positioned to, to take advantage of that. Uh, I do like to, to, give, to, to sign off here with uh, the fact to put it all back in perspective, though, we've been talking about machines that take 20 megawatts plus, these exascale machines, uh, to model the human brain. Well, it's important to note the human brain takes about 20 watts to run. So there's an awful lot of room for improvement right there, right? We're hoping to be able to run in real-time human brain with, you know, 20 megawatts. Well, 
Uh, so there's, there's an awful lot of, uh, of room for improvement and development, and so even though Moore's Law and some other things are, are coming to these depressing asymptotes, uh, the, the world will remain exciting and, and there will be lots of development and evolution to come. I hope you're very motivated now as we're going to about to jump into the actual programming. We're going to get our hands dirty and start writing code. Fear not. Like I said, this was all the overview and buzzwords, but I'm going to refer back to a lot of the stuff over the next day and a half, so I wanted to, to, to put it all in one place. Parallel computing is, is no fad, right? This is not something that's optional. We can see we've been forced into it by physics. No getting around it. Thermodynamics in particular, right? We have to go parallel, and that's why everything's parallel. Uh, and if you, if you jump on board the, the right approach to this stuff, which I guarantee you is MPI, uh, you're, you're going to have, uh, you're going to get great utility out of it, not just now, but for the indefinite future. Every roadmap for these big machines that's being built, all the exascale machines, the programming model for them is MPI. People hope some other things might come on board, but the programming model for every machine that's being funded right now to be built in the next five, six years, the baseline programming model is MPI how they're assuming it. And again, the pieces fit together like this. You know, you might program a single processor uh, with OpenMP, do multi-threaded programming. You might plug in a GPU and program it with CUDA, OpenACC, <laughs> OpenCL. But the second you go beyond that to multiple nodes, it's, it's MPI. 